I remember trying to be as respectful as possible. Now, this can be hard uh, when you're talking to someone and you feel like they're kind of just out of line with the realities of living uh, in the modern era. I was, I was speaking to an elderly man at the time who I do have a great deal of respect for, and he was presenting the argument that computers are just awful. Like, they are literally the worst thing that has ever been created. The downfall, indeed, of civilization. And I had heard people joke before, you know, calling them devil boxes or something like that. But this was the, the first person outside the Amish community that I had legitimately met that believed that these were devil boxes. Like, created by Satan to destroy uh, the world. And, and I'm friends with his wife on Facebook, which is just like, how is that possible? I don't know. So maybe he's come around a little bit since then. But in our conversation, I noticed, like, hey, look, you drive a car. You have a TV. Uh, you talk on a phone. I mean, at which point did technology finally become too evil uh, to participate in? I mean, that is the argument of, of Amish communities, right? That, like at a certain point in time, everything beyond that is a technology that is evil. And everything before that, like uh, alloys or certain metals or, uh, or the wheel, you know, any, any number of technologies, these are all okay. And I feel like every generation uh, does that. Right? In their youth, uh, 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 we espouse the value of these things that, that they can bring, the value these technologies can bring, while honestly acknowledging the dangers they present. And so I asked him, at what point, at what point did technology become too advanced? Uh, was it the printing press, or was it, uh, uh, was it um, drugs like penicillin? Was it the ability to create these metals? Uh, and, and it's the defense I feel every young person gives, right? Like, uh, in my youth, I certainly gave the same defenses, and you probably uh, did in your youth as well, of uh, these are just things they are part of living in the modern world. And I'm just glad that uh, it'll never happen to me. Like, I'll never get to a point where I look at all these newfangled technologies and go, they're the downfall of civilization. I will always objectively view technology as a tool, something that can be used for good or bad, something uh, that naturally evolved over the years and decades. I certainly won't view these technologies in and of themselves as threats to human society or the church. After all, you know, it's not the gun, it's the person that uses it. That's just the truth. And with some level of, without sarcasm, I can still say that that's partly true. Like the technologies that exist in the world today can be used for good uh, or for bad. It is hard, however, to view certain technologies and not ask, is this really doing us good? Is this really serving the benefit of mankind? Is this really accomplishing uh, what it's supposed to be? Or is it causing irreparable harm? And when I think about things like uh, the cell phone or the mobile computer app, right? Did you know cell phones existed before the smartphone? When I think about things like this, I feel myself sometimes transforming into that elderly man and becoming tempted to just throw the fancy doohickey on the ground and smash it with a good old-fashioned hammer. Sometimes I certainly feel like that. And it would be one thing to look at the impact of, of devices like this that, that it has on the minds of teens and kids, and we're going to do that uh, this evening. But honestly, I, I don't even have to step outside of myself to see the harm that can come from my constant engagement with something like this. I have spent countless hours ingesting uh, YouTube and scrolling through Facebook, both on my phone and on my computer. I have neglected responsibilities and, and relationships to feed an addiction. And I am aware of this, as I'm, many, uh, as I'm sure many of you are as well. But I still struggle sometimes to combat that enemy at the gate that is technology. Have you ever uh, been engaged in something? Whether it's scrolling on your phone or playing a video game or watching YouTube videos and looking at the clock and going, holy cow, what just happened to that four hours of my life? There's a decent chance that you fight this enemy too. And whether it's the endless scroll of Facebook, the sleepless, sleepless nights of Call of Duty, or the constant curating of your image on Instagram, many can relate to the hours committed or wasted engaging with technology. 
And that's not even to touch on uh, the technology's ease in presenting damaging images of, of pornography to younger and younger audiences, or its ability to embolden individuals who thrive on insulting and deriding other human beings. Have you ever heard of keyboard warriors? Trolls? Those who gain their identity simply by going to other people's posts and saying awful things? Our culture's relationship with the screen is almost enough for me to line up with the old timers and just say, burn it. Burn it all, burn it to the ground. Almost. But the truth is, is what this device provides is really just another experience and a long line of experiences the enemy has used to gain influence over us. Now, don't get me wrong. This is an effective one. Uh, probably the most effective one uh, within the last several hundred years. It is effective at pulling us away from God. But at the end of the day, it's just another football. It's as money is, it's as politics is. It is an idol that we have made, that we have allowed to have uh, an, un, an appropriate amount of influence over us. I still own this phone, and as far into the future as I can imagine, I'm going to own it. I do have YouTube on it, and I still watch and listen to podcasts and news and, and how-to videos and even some stupid stuff that just makes me laugh. I still do that. And my message today is not going to end with a phone-burning party, <laughs> because that would be bad for the environment. You can recycle it at Best Buy. <laughs> but it will include a call to think about how we engage with technology, and I'm here to tell you that engaging with technology requires maturity. It's something that you have to have the thought process going into uh, an understanding of what it can do to you. It is the wisdom and intelligence to comprehend uh, that the things we engage with impact us. It is sitting down with that device and going, I understand that this can have an undue uh, influence over me and I need to engage with it with that understanding. It is the ability to understand our actions and the implications of our actions, not just on ourselves, but on those around us as well. We need to have an understanding on how those things will impact us. Maturity acknowledges the importance of self-mastery, that I am in control over my faculties, and recognizes our weaknesses the dangers that lie ahead of us, as well as it recognizes our traits. Uh, during my second go at college, I lived off campus. Did you know that Anna didn't marry me the first time because she said I was too immature? <laughs> Can you believe that? She waited 10 years before she would go out with me. But during my second go, I lived off campus uh, because I understood of the, the challenges of on campus as I was too social. My roommate was an avid gamer. In fact, right now, he is the manager of one of the biggest game stops uh, in Germany. And, and he was this avid gamer. And as such, our living room was just filled with all of the newest consoles. The newest Xbox, he had it. The newest PlayStation, he had it. He had a Wii U. Who in here owned a Wii U? Yeah, like five of you, right? <laughs> he had all of them, and, and he had all this, this stuff because it was the newest thing, so he had to have it. And what that meant for me was that I had ready access to a technology that I enjoyed, that helped me decompress, and that in some ways was social. And I quickly learned this, that if I went home after classes, I did not have the discipline to prioritize my schoolwork over that, especially if it was reading. I hate reading. So I made a decision. I wouldn't go home right after classes. It might take me six years, but I actually learned that Ozark had a library. <laughs> Who knew? And so almost every day after class, I didn't drive home. I went to the library, and I spent a couple hours there getting my work done, or at least the majority of it, especially getting my reading done, because I understood that if I went home, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. Maturity wasn't beating my chest and saying, I will defeat this temptation. Maturity was saying, I can't. And so I need to change my environment. I need to change what I am doing so that I can have victory. 
Now, since I have been uh, married, I haven't owned a gaming console. Joe had one for a while, which was nice because I got to play it. <laughs> but I still enjoy playing them every once in a while. One of the greatest things I look forward to is when my small group goes over to our friend's house and plays Mario Kart. Like, it's a good time for me. And maturity comes with recognizing what is healthy and what is unhealthy and what is helpful and what is hurtful and learning to change your environment so you can engage in something with moderation without it being able to destroy you. It is a matter of focusing on what is truly important in the eternal scale. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul challenges his readers by asking them to focus on the goal and do whatever is necessary to attain it. That is maturity. Verse 24 starts like this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may attain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable crown, uh, but we an imperishable. So do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. We do what we must to attain the prize. We do what we must to have victory. We do what we must to maintain ourselves as holy and true before God. Self-mastery is not only a lost art in our postmodern society, but it is seen as restrictive or inappropriate. And we are engaging a society that says self-mastery is a bad thing. Controlling ourselves is wrong. The right thing is giving in to our carnal desires. The right thing is doing whatever we feel in the moment. To set timers on your Facebook time or delete Instagram altogether is to withhold from yourself something that you desire, which is sinful in the cultural religion of self-gratification. But we do not worship the gods of the culture. We worship the God of the universe, and the Christian seeks to be holy and to receive the imperishable gift of eternal life. Maturity allows us to keep in context the things of the culture that we might engage with. And we keep it in the context of the grand scheme of eternity. Our TVs, our phones, our gaming consoles, they're not what's waiting for us on the other side. Maturity does allow us to see the potential benefit of said technology, but also the potential harm. You know, Anna and I used to watch a, a YouTube video every night, but almost every night before we went to bed. It was a daily uh, thing for us, just a short 15-minute little video. And we would watch it, and uh, it would just help us decompress. We could turn off our brains. We could laugh a little bit. And then uh, she'd lay on my shoulder for a little bit, and then she'd get tired, and I'd push her away because it's, you know, over there. And then, and then we'd go to sleep. And that was our nightly routine. That's what we did. And there was nothing wrong with taking 15 minutes to decompress and laugh, but doing it just before bed prevented us from having a time that was previously reserved for us. No other distractions. You guys familiar with the term pillow talk? It was just us being able to talk with no kids screaming at us, uh, about our days and what we were feeling and what we were engaging in. And when, and when we uh, started that habit, we lost all of the good. We made a choice. We both saw the harm that it was doing us, and, and we said, hey, we're not going to do this anymore. Now, we still on occasion will, but it is not a habit for us. It is something that we have let go of so that we can regain a part of our marriage that we lost straight up to our cell phone. This idea of maturity lends itself to the question of what responsibility do mature adults have to teens and tweens that lack such maturity? Because it's easy for me to stand up here and talk about me, to talk about us, to talk about you, to say, hey, how are you engaging with your cell phone? But the next logical question is, how do those of us that are mature handle this topic with those of those who are not? to the teens and the tweens who physically do not have uh, the development in their prefrontal cortex to understand what they are constantly feeding themselves. And I know some incredibly mature teenagers, but look, you can't beat biology. It's there. And I know a heck of a lot more immature teenagers. 
And what happens when we take technologies like social media, YouTube, and mobile phones and place them in the hands of teenagers whose brains are not developed enough to handle them? Well, we get statistics like these. If you can't read that, that is a doubling, the doubling of, of young girls, adolescents who have uh, been admitted to the ER for self-harm since 2009. And you can pretend that this has nothing to do with social media, but plenty of reports would back up that this has a lot to do with the impacts of social media and the engagement and the bullying and this idea of curating this perfect self-image of what am I supposed to look like and then realizing, well, I don't stack up to that person. That's what this is. The perfect snap, the ideal relationship status. And for gentlemen, self-harm isn't as big of an issue, though that's partly related to the reality that when young men harm themselves, they're much better at killing themselves. They succeed. They don't make it to the hospital. They also don't engage in the use of social media to the same extent that young women do. For my men in here, you can probably relate that gaming and YouTube are probably what we get sucked into, at least men of my generation. So how do the mature, those of us who are capable of maturity, protect those who are physically not able to make wise decisions? Well, look, i got to say, as a parent, prohibition is part of the answer. We don't throw these technologies in the hands of our adolescents and our tweens and our young people and say, hey, I hope you figure it out. Because that image, those statistics, is a result of that experiment. But it's not only prohibition, it's also through alternative experiences. Yes, we should not be allowing our daughters to participate in activities that will increase the likelihood of them cutting themselves. But maturity also looks like providing outlets for that young person to thrive. Did you know that sleep is really, really important? Did you know that being involved in sporting events or attending church or actually spending time with our kids as a family is important? At this point, there is no denying the science and objective truth of this. The way we, gain, we engage with technology is destroying a generation. My generation failed the experiment. We raised our kids on Facebook and YouTube. And look, my kids, they watch Netflix and Disney. They spend an hour a day watching TV. There are times that I get home and I have sat on the couch uh, on, on my phone or on YouTube and they've been over there watching couch, on, on, on the couch watching TV and I admit that there's been moments where I've looked up and gone, what in the world am I doing here? But it's easy. So much easier than playing with them. I'm only 37 years old and man, I get like five minutes in the ring with them and I'm like, dude, turn on the TV. I'm done. <laughs> That's not fair to them. And they do play Wadoku on my phone. We, the, the games that we allow them to play, we try to make sure they still engage the mind. They, they're not forbidden from our technology, but it is always in moderation with a recognition that we are in control of what they do because we are the parents. We are responsible for them. And Paul reminds us, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, look, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And as a parent, I look at my children, and yes, even teenagers. When, 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 when Joe was uh, with us, living with us, we engaged with him about this. And he didn't have everything that everyone else at school had. Engaging in technology requires maturity. And for those that are young, if you're looking within yourself and saying, boy, I don't have the maturity to handle this, then you better set up some limits and change your environments so this doesn't gain control over you. It requires maturity in our own interaction with us and in the interaction between it and those in our responsibility, which naturally means that engaging with technology requires balance. Yes. As I spoke to that elderly man before, technology can do an awful lot of good. Technology has some terrible side effects, but it's also an integral part of our society. I'm glad someone invented the printing press. I'm glad someone invented the internet, usually. 
I'm glad someone invented a software called Logos, which is probably single-handedly responsible for me passing principles of interpretation and graduating. If you're unfamiliar, the first time I went to school, we had to do all of our Greek word studies from a book. But someone invented Logos which allowed you to click on a word and it would break down the Greek and it would give you all the information you needed to do your Greek word studies. And I don't know what you use now, but I'm sure you have some software. And I am grateful because I probably wouldn't be preaching here if someone didn't invent Logos. Technology does some okay things. I'm glad we have a lights that allow us to worship when it's dark outside. I'm glad we have projectors and software that usually make worship more approachable when they're working. I'm glad we have streaming, which allows uh, those who cannot attend church to still participate in what's going on here. But all of these benefits must be balanced with the real danger of the tool becoming the target. That is to say, rather than using something like technology for worship, technology becomes the recipient of our worship. And you can usually start to see it when people start talking about everything great they have. Our church has these great lights smoke machines and lasers, and when I'm there, I can really feel the presence of God because of what I can see the technology doing. When we go from, wow, amp, amps really allow everyone to hear the guitar, to, wow, this production is amazing, we are in danger of slipping into adoration rather than appreciation. Do you see, do you see the difference between appreciation and in adoration, when we do, we give something that was created by man power that it ought not to have over us. And so we approach technology with balance. Second Kings chapter 17, we begin to see some cracks in the nation of Israel. And there was a time in Israel's uh, past when God was the focus. Remember Joshua, we have no God uh, but God, and our families, we're all going to worship God forever and ever. That was the times past. He was recognized as the source of all good things, and he was given honor and glory. But by verse uh, 15 of 2 Kings chapter 17, we see this. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers, and the warnings that he gave. They went after false idols and became false, and they follow the nations that were around them. If you read on in the text, you see they made calves of metal and asherah, and they sacrificed their sons to foreign gods. And this occurred because they followed the nations around them. And we can see the stats, right? We live in a generation of people that are literally sacrificing our children to these foreign gods. They're dying cutting themselves, and killing themselves because of what they are experiencing. And technology has this opportunity to draw us away from God. It has this ability to become the focus of our worship. If we allow it, it can be the thing rather than a thing that points us to God. And technology ought to be a thing that draws us into His presence. Look, as Christians, we're going to engage with technology. It's not simply a matter of rejecting it. Like, that, that ship has sailed, right? We live in a world of technology. We engage with technology. In order to reject technology, you have to start asking the question of how far back am I going to go? That, that's the natural question. That was my conversation with this gentleman. How far back do you want to go? And for the dangers of ideology that technology may produce, the church has a choice to either follow what the culture has done, which is creating an idol of it, or we can lead. The church can lead in this. We can engage in healthy conversations about what technology is and what it does. Uh, we, we can be the parents that don't let our eight-year-olds have the newest phone. We can be the ones that put extra value on family activity and sports and church activity. We can demonstrate maturity while also placing for ourselves loved one boundaries that protect them. We can do that. But in order to do that, we must engage technology with humility. 
I don't think anyone likes to believe that they are not in control. I like to believe I am in control of my life. I mean, that is, uh, and, and, and I don't want to get into the God is in control thing aspect. I just mean the things that I do on my day to day. Look, I want to believe the Spirit is leading me and guiding me and, and that I have control over my faculties. And this is an exception to maybe thrill seekers, like they just want to jump out of a plane and hope they survive. I suspect most of us like to think that we are capable of handling our lives. Most of us like to think uh, that we can just deal with the temptations. And many times in my ministry, I've informed people um, that I love macaroni and cheese. I've called the bane of my existence. Some of you have paid for my macaroni and cheese. And my wife has spent years training me to just say no so that I don't get a tummy ache and I ought to have control over myself. Do you get it? Like we should be able to just say no to things. And thankfully at this point in my life, I generally do when it comes to mac and cheese. I'm able to just say no and keep it in moderation. But all of us must understand that addiction is addiction. This is not simply a matter of, well, why don't they just stop? Addiction is real. And our desire to engage with something is often beyond our capacity to simply say no. And it's easy when we're talking about things like drugs or, or, or alcohol or, or sex or those things to say, well, they just need to stop. But when it's our own addiction and our own sin, well, then all of a sudden, it's difficult. We must understand that sometimes the only way to not spend four hours in front of our phone is to not pick it up. Let there be no confusion about this. The, the endless scroll of Facebook releases the same chemicals in your brain as cocaine does, all right? It, it's, all, it, it's all just this, uh, this path of satisfaction. The short video form of TikTok uh, leaves us constantly unsatisfied, making us wonder, well, what's the next video going to bring? Well, maybe the next video will, will hit the spot. Gambling does the same thing. It's always about what's next. And we dig deeper into consumption to fill that insatiable longing for satisfaction. No man should be so prideful as to believe that they are beyond temptation that the cell phone or the computer or the gaming console provides us. Because technology like the smartphone is not merely a tool of the enemy at the gate. It's a tool belt. It's a toolbox. It is a collection of everything the enemy wants to use to destroy us, and we just pick it up without thinking about it. It provides countless avenues of access into our hearts and to our minds. Uh, our sermon series started with opportunity. Do you strive for opportunity, whether it's to seize the day, get rich, or find a house? Well, guess what? There's an app for that. There sure is. Do you want solutions to combat sickness or track your health to a degree of vanity? Well, there's an app for that, too. Do you want to engage in gossip and keep up on whatever the famous per person is doing? There's an app for that. Do you want to stimulate the passions of the flesh that we talked about last week? Well, there's an app for that, too. There's a lot of apps for that. The smartphone is a toolbox for the enemy, and while it and other technologies bring lots of good to the table, we would be foolish to believe that Satan isn't constantly probing and using this thing that we keep so close to our heart. Hey, look, let me ask you this. If Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok can have algorithms that show you what you want to see based on what you click and how many seconds you have viewed any particular video, don't you think the enemy has the same system? There's an awful lot of demons that work in IT <laughs> that track our every single motion go, aha, that person watched that video for a while. I bet I can exploit that. And humility leads us to ask the questions of technology. Does this software, this app, or this device, does it really help grow me? Which, yes, sometimes means decompression. It sometimes mean, means an easy laugh. But does it grow me? Or does it conform me? Because that's the downfall of Israel. They conformed to the worship of the world. 
And that's always been the struggle uh, with the church, not just in our generation, but in every generation. And whether it's sports or money or sex or whatever it may be, we have always struggled with allowing our behavior and our faith uh, to be determined by God rather than by the culture around us. Paul challenges us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We've heard it before. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewing our mind does not happen on TikTok. It happens when we're engaged in the word and prayer. Is our use of technology growing us or conforming us? In humility, let us approach technology, phones, tablets, computers, TVs, consoles, whatever it is with the spirit of humility and recognizing the power that it can have over us. Because it is a lot. Let us grow in maturity through the study of scripture and prayer and fellowship so that these devil boxes may not become an unbalanced part of our life that leads to our destruction. And I don't know what conversations they'll be having about uh, cell phones 50 years from now. Maybe they'll be talking about it the same way we talk about TV or the printing press. Like, oh, that's that thing that they struggled with all those years ago that they thought was evil and then turned out not to be so bad. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to say. What I do know is this, in the here and now, the enemy is at the gate. And he is keen to use all of the tools at his disposal to attack his people. And technology will always be a box flush with weapons to use against God's people. But I'll tell you this. The words of the psalmist in Psalm 27 pierce my mind. Some trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fail, but we rise and stand upright. You realize when this was written, the chariot was like the pentacle of war machines. It was this incredible technology. When you read through through the history of Israel, when they're talking about armies, they talk about how many spears and how many bows and and how many chariots they have. All this great technology of war fighting that's going to lead us to victory. Technologies of bronze and iron and chariots and arrows, and they all succumb to the power of God. And some may trust in that. And some may say, this will lead the world forward because it's such a great thing with information at our fingertips. As the power of God pushed back the Red Sea and then allowed it to swallow the modern tanks of Pharaoh's army, so also we as the people of God should not be enamored by the technologies of the world. Some may trust in that. Some may hold it up and some may say it's the future and some may say that it is a power too big to ignore. But the people of God will not succumb to these weapons of modern technology, nor will we surrender to their temptations. And by the Spirit of God, and with the fellowship of saints, it is the church, us, that will push back the assault of the enemy. And until our Savior returns, it is the church that will hold back the enemy at the gate. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly God, it's so easy to see all the powers of the world. It's so easy to see things like mobile phones and gaming consoles and social media and these things that are destroying lives left and right. And Oh man, what do we do? How do we conquer such powerful weapons? God, I pray that you would give us the strength. First off, give us the strength, Lord, not to succumb to these weapons. Lord, give us the strength not to fear these weapons. Lord, you have called us to take every thought captive. God, I pray you give us a heart to take all things captive so that the weapons of the enemy may be used against him. God, give us wisdom as we engage with these technological advances. Lord, for us as parents, give us wisdom as we seek to raise our kids in a social media age. 
God, in everything, may we lean on you. May we trust in you. And may we expect your victory. And may we do our part. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've talked a lot over the past five weeks. We're, we're done with the enemy at the gate. He's not done with us. If a sermon series can come to an end, we can understand that. We can start talking about what we're going to talk about next week. And it's, but it's not like the enemy is like, oh, oh, man, they beat me. The battle is ongoing. And so as we sing this song, recognizing the power of God, of everything uh, that he is, the one who created us, the one who is in control, uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity to just surrender to that to recognize that the enemy of the gate is still there. And the victory didn't come through a sermon series. The victory comes through surrendering your life to Jesus. And so as we sing this song, if that's something you would like to do today, to surrender to the one who will win, I'd love to talk with you. Will you stand and sing with us?